So I'm filming in the morning instead of at night. So if you can hear the birds that are um, serenading me outside. Sorry, but there ain't a damn thing I can do about it. What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. If this is your first time seeing my face, my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'd say subscribe. And if not, I'd say don't. It's a fairly simple concept. And if you do happen to fall in the second camp, then fear not because just for you, I've taken some time to list some other creators and resources down in the description box that have covered today's story in a way that perhaps is more suited to your liking. And with all of that said and done, let's go ahead and get into today's case. All right, so today's case is a requested case, which I feel like I have not done in forever, but I guess it's actually only been a few weeks. Honestly, I can't even remember what my last requested case was. Oh, it was the Tammy Call and Leesville Trio case. That's right. And that was what, three, four-ish weeks ago? Anyways, get psyched because we're doing a request today. And this one specifically comes from our friend Jennifer. So if everyone could take a second and join me in thanking Jennifer for requesting this story, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Jennifer even though this case does enrage me to the very core of my being. Seriously, I don't even think I could quantify a guess as to how many times while I was researching and mapping out this case that I got so frustrated that I just had to slam my laptop shut and walk away from it. This case honestly makes my blood boil. Today, we were talking about the disappearance and very probable murder of 17-year-old Molly Miller and 21-year-old Colt Haynes. And in my opinion, it is so incredibly obvious. Uh, I guess not exactly what happened, but to me, it seems obvious at the very least who's responsible. But even so, spoiler alert, ain't shit being done about it. And it is real frustrating, which I assume that most of you will agree with. However, seeing as though we can't have a conversation about our collective thoughts until I actually tell you guys the story, why don't I just start at the beginning? Molly Michelle Miller was born on April 30th, 1996 in the very small, very rural town of Wilson, Oklahoma. Wilson is located in southwestern Carter County in Oklahoma, and it has a population of just under 2,000 people. It covers less than six square miles of land, but the most densely populated area looks like it's only about, I don't know, like a third of that. So it's definitely one of those quintessential everybody knows everybody sort of towns. And it's also where Molly Miller spent her incredibly short 17 years of life. Molly was a loving, funny, outspoken, and very outgoing person. She loved her family and she absolutely adored her friends. She was smart and athletic. She was an incredible softball player. And even though she was just a teenager, Molly had already committed to a vocational training program with the end goal of becoming a nurse. Based on most of what I could gather about Molly, I don't think it's an out-of-pocket statement to say that overall, she seems like she was a pretty great kid. However, even the best kids can fall victim to the rebellious teen phase, and it sounds like this was certainly the case with Molly towards like the end of 2012, beginning of 2013. From my understanding, around this time, she started sort of butting heads with her parents. She was coming home well beyond her curfew and she seemingly kind of put her schooling on the back burner. And much like I said in the Jenna Gamble video, to me, this just sounds like some average teenage girl, let's call them growing pains. But evidently Molly's parents felt a little more seriously about everything that was going on. They felt like she had really fallen in with the wrong crowd. And if they didn't do something about it, they thought that she could really end up in a lot of trouble. And with that fear in mind, in November of 2012, her parents had actually started tossing around the idea of having Molly go and stay with her cousin Paula for a while. And I guess that they thought that this would help to mitigate some of the trouble that she seemed to be finding herself in at home. Paula lived about two hours outside of Wilson at the time, and Molly's parents seemed to feel like Molly might be more apt to listen to someone other than her parents. Someone that she had more of a mutual respect for, rather than her parents, whom she felt like were just trying 
trying to control her and keep her from having fun and living her best life. A feeling I'm sure we've all felt about our parents at one time or another. You know, it's the old, you can't see the full picture if you're too close to it sort of rhetoric. When you're a teenager, you don't have the life experience to understand that your parents aren't ever trying to ruin your life or hold you back. Rather that they're likely saying and doing everything that they're doing in order to protect you and to make sure that you're safe and that you have a well-rounded understanding of the world before you venture too far out of the nest so to speak. And I just don't really think that you can fully appreciate or understand that until you're far enough removed from high school and from adolescence. And Paula was totally on board for this. She would have been more than happy to have Molly come and stay with her and to help her get her priorities straightened back out. Unfortunately, though, this arrangement would never come to be because just eight short months later, on July 7th, 2013, Molly, along with her friend, 21-year-old Colt Haynes, would go missing without a trace. And to this day, almost 10 years later, neither Molly nor Colt have ever been found. When last Molly and Colt were seen, they were in the company of one other young man, 22-year-old James Conn Nip. But before we get any further, we know Molly, but who exactly were these other two gentlemen? Well, if you'll remember, I briefly mentioned that Molly's parents felt like she was falling in with the wrong crowd. Yes? Well, Colt wasn't one of those people, but James sure was. James Con Nip, who goes by Con, so that's what I'll be referring to him as going forward, was born on June 12, 1991 in Overbrook, Oklahoma, which is located in Love County, sitting about 30 to 40 minutes outside of Wilson. He grew up almost on like a family compound. At least that's what it sounds like to me. His family owns this like huge plot of land in Overbrook, spanning over like a thousand acres, most of which is just covered with thick, thick woods. And from what I was able to gather through third party statements about Khan, he wasn't like the best guy. Allegedly, he used to beat an ex-girlfriend of his. He was heavily involved in drugs. And one of the things he was really well known for was instigating super dangerous high-speed car chases with police. Cause I guess in rural Oklahoma, ain't nothing better to do with one's time. Honestly, it just really sounds like he was brought up with very few if any, restrictions on what he was allowed to do. Therefore, even as an adult, he still acted like an irresponsible man baby because he knew that he would very likely not see any consequences. And this was especially true considering the fact that the sheriff of Love County, the man that was supposed to manage the county, ensure security, and generally keep everyone safe, yeah, that man, Joe Russell, He's Khan's cousin. So not only was he not seeing any repercussions from his actions from his immediate family, but he knew that the law would likely always bend in his favor as well. Basically, Khan was just running around free as a bird, causing one hell of a ruckus all up and down those rural backwoods Oklahoma streets. So when Molly started hanging around with Khan, no one in her family was really all that jazzed about it. Her older brother Garrett actually knew Khan from school. Garrett was a few years older than Khan. And I'm assuming that Molly and Khan had crossed paths at some point, purely because they lived in such a small area. And like I said before, basically everyone from around that area knew one another or at least had crossed paths with one another before. That said, how did the third player in our story fit into all of this, you may be wondering. Colt Rydell Haynes was born on April 28th, 1992 also in Wilson. And unfortunately, I really don't have a lot of information on Colt and who he was as a person. Molly's family has definitely been the more outspoken of the families involved in the case, which is why I had an easier time finding the information I was able to on her. And admittedly, that still wasn't even as in-depth as I like to go, but nevertheless, according to what I was able to find, Colt seems like he was a good guy who just happened to get himself wrapped into some not- so great stuff. He graduated from Wilson High School in 2010. And from there, according to his Facebook, it looks like he worked at a restaurant, then for a masonry company. And up until he was last seen, it looks like he was working for a tire company. So, I mean, it seems like he was a hard worker, or at the very least, it seems like he was employed more often than not. But perhaps the most important thing to know about Colt was that in October of 2012, 
he became a father to a little boy. And ironically, that's actually, in a weird roundabout way, how Colt and Khan knew each other. Let me explain. So remember how I said that Khan was rumored to have allegedly been abusive to one of his past girlfriends? Well, that was a girl named Katie that he dated for about three years, give or take. And that relationship ended in January of 2012. And almost immediately after Katie met and began dating Colt, and in October of 2012, she gave birth to Colt's son. And given how Khan supposedly treated Katie, you're probably assuming that Colt was not Khan's biggest fan. And in that assumption, you would be correct. In fact, in Katie's own words, Colt hated Khan. Not disliked, not didn't care for, hated. And having that information may lead you to wonder why the actual hell Colt was with Khan the night he and Molly disappeared. And to that I say, join the club, bitch. That's what we all want to know. Seriously though, no one can say for sure what brought them together that night, but the most widely speculated and widely believed theory is that the reason that Colt, Molly, and Khan were together that evening was drug related. Molly and Colt had met each other about a week prior to their disappearance. They'd been introduced through a mutual friend of theirs. And there's really not a way to definitively say what their relationship to one another was. A lot of people say they were dating. A lot of people say that they were just friends. Some people say that Molly was really into Colt, but whether or not the feeling was mutual is up for debate. Bottom line is, I don't really know how exactly to classify their relationship. Both of their Facebooks have their relationship status set to single, so maybe they weren't dating yet and just getting to know each other. You know, they were in the talking phase. Do y'all. Remember the talking phase. We're not dating, we're just talking. Ah, young love. Anyways, looking into this case, there's a lot of conflicting opinions on what Molly and Colt were to each other. But at the end of the day, I don't really think it matters because dating, friends, talking, regardless of how they would have classified themselves, the outcome of the story remains the same. So what actually happened the night that Colt and Molly went missing? Well. A lot of stuff. So brace yourself. Because every time you think this story has gone as far off the rails as it possibly can, it immediately goes further awry. But I will try to keep it all as concise and streamlined and easy to follow as I possibly can. So July 7th, 2013. For some reason, Molly, Colt, and Connor hanging out, which, like I mentioned, is widely speculated that it was drugs that had ultimately brought the trio together that evening, because Khan was certainly known to be an integral part of the Love County, Carter County drug scene. And people close to both Molly and Colt have spoken openly about the fact that both of them had been dabbling in drugs prior to their disappearance. And honestly, that's pretty much one of the only reasons that I can think of that Colt may have put aside his disdain for Khan is drugs. Because I think we all know the desperate lengths that people in active addiction will go to to secure their next fix. Honestly, hanging out with someone you dislike seems pretty mild in comparison to some of the horror stories I've heard. So I don't feel like I need to stretch before I take the jump to the conclusion that the three of them were probably doing drugs together that night. But outside of that, the three of them were last seen at a convenience store in Wilson together at around 10.30 p.m. that evening. I don't know what they were getting. I don't know what their plans were meant to be following this pit stop, but I do know that the three of them were riding around in Khan's girlfriend Sabrina's 2012 Honda Accord, which Khan was driving. They were hanging out. To the best of my knowledge, everything was copacetic super cash, when all of a sudden, Khan starts acting like a complete just buffoon. Because apparently, also parked in the convenience store parking lot, happened to be two Wilson police officers. And as previously mentioned, Khan loved nothing more than to antagonize police and try to instigate car chases. And that night was no exception. Once he noticed the officers sitting in their cars, he decided to rev his engine, before doing a donut in the parking lot and intentionally kicking up a bunch of rocks and gravel towards their cruisers. And once he knew he had their attention, he then took off out of the parking lot as fast as he could, knowing that they'd obviously have no choice but to follow him. Which, shocker, they did. And 
From there, Khan proceeded to take them on a high-speed chase all throughout downtown Wilson until he hit the highway. Then he turned his headlights off and gunned it towards Love County. All this while Colt and Molly are practically held hostage in the car with him. And I cannot even begin to imagine how scary this must have been for them for so many reasons. One, I think that being driven in a car that fast by anyone would be scary, let alone by this loser who clearly doesn't have regard for the safety of anyone involved. And two, if they all were high, like it's widely believed they were, there's a chance that they were feeling a little bit paranoid anyway. And now they're being chased by police. There's really not a scenario in which this situation has an awesome ending. They must have felt so helpless and so out of control through all of this, as did the Wilson police officers, especially when they crossed county lines into territory that they were less familiar with. They actually ended up reaching out to Love County for assistance in their pursuit of this vehicle, I guess hoping that their knowledge of the area could help them apprehend this psycho before he seriously hurt someone. Because these back roads that wind all throughout rural Oklahoma, they are pitch black. So if you're unfamiliar with the area or you don't really know where you're going, they can be incredibly difficult to navigate. But even so, Wilson officers did the absolute best they could to follow him until eventually they lost him as he turned off of Oswalt Road onto Long Hollow Road, which is where the Nip family owned that massive area of property I told you about. And infuriatingly, instead of Love County picking up the pursuit or even rendering aid when Wilson had reached out to them, they did not that. And that's because Love County Sheriff, you know, good old boy Joe Russell, Khan's cousin, well, he took matters into his own hands with the sole purpose to protect his kinfolk. And just before 11 p.m., he put out an announcement to his officers to stand down. Reason being that he didn't want his officers or his department's vehicles involved in a car chase. To be fair, I'm sure that most departments don't want their officers involved in high-speed chases. It's dangerous to the officers. It's dangerous to civilian bystanders. It could be really expensive if multiple department vehicles get damaged. I get that. And I think we all know that that's not what this was about. This was not about protecting anything other than his cousin. In my opinion. Because if this had any motive other than nepotism, at the very least, he would have taken down an incident report right? I mean, that seems like the absolute bare minimum. But Joe Russell didn't even have that done. He just called off his officers and moved on with his evening. And because of this, it's almost impossible to know exactly what happened to our trio in the moments directly following their break away from police. From about 11 p.m. when the chase ended until sometime between 12.30 and 1 a.m. on July 8th, we have really no idea what exactly happened. That's an hour and a half to two hours that are just a huge question mark, as is a ton of the rest of the story, but <laughs> let's take it one step at a time. So Molly and Colt were off the radar, so to speak, for like upwards of two hours, give or take. And they didn't pop back up on said metaphorical radar until just before 1 a.m. when Molly began repeatedly calling 911. Now, the dispatcher who took these calls couldn't actually hear anything from the other end of them, save for some shuffling and button pushing. And this went on for a few seconds each time before the call abruptly ended. The dispatcher did try to call Molly's phone back following at least one of these hangups, but unfortunately they never received an answer. And from my understanding, this would typically warrant an officer being sent out to the location of the call to verify the caller's safety. I mean, if you simply Google 911 hang up protocol, the main result is pretty much the same across the board. If you hang up on an operator, they'll call you back to confirm that you're safe. And if no one answers the attempted call back, then law enforcement officers will be dispatched to your location to ascertain the nature of the call. However, for some reason, when it came to Molly's repeated phone calls, that didn't happen. The dispatcher called back, no one answered, and they were just like, ah, well, done all I can do. And I could maybe, and that's a big maybe, but I could maybe try to pacify this negligence if Molly had called once, but she didn't. She called, I think, something close to like 12 or so times, rapidly, back to back. I'm not sure if maybe she couldn't get good service where she was and that's why the calls kept dropping or what, but 
Either way, she tried multiple times to reach out for help, and her calls were all but completely ignored. Looking back, it's been determined that Molly's calls were coming from the woods just outside of the Kahn family property at the corner of Pike and Oswalt Roads. However, at the time, Molly and Colt had absolutely no idea where they were. And we know that because Molly didn't just call 911. Rather, over the following few hours, both Molly and Colt reached out to or attempted to reach out to over 30 different friends and family members. And according to the few people that they actually managed to get a hold of, they frantically told them that Khan had dropped them off in the middle of nowhere following the car chase. They knew that they were somewhere off of Oswald or Long Hollow Road, but beyond that, they were completely in the dark, literally and figuratively. They were totally isolated in hundreds of acres of woods in the dead of night. No street lights, no sense of direction, no food, no water, no transportation, just nothing. They were totally and completely 100% stranded. And when I say stranded, I mean it. They couldn't even walk around and try and figure out their own way back to the main road because at some point towards the beginning of this whole ordeal, Colt had climbed one of the surrounding trees, I think in order to either see if he could see the road or maybe get better service. I have to imagine that there was some logical reason that he was climbing trees at a time like this. I highly doubt he was just up there monkeying around for the hell of it. Anyways, regardless of why he was up there, the problem was that while Colt was in this tree, the branch he was on broke and he fell quite a ways down, ultimately breaking his ankle. And we are talking compound fracture, baby, as in bone sticking out of skin, where bones ain't got no place being. And that is why I say they were stranded. I mean it in the most literal sense of the word. They were quite literally stuck in one place and did not have the means or ability to move. And we know for a fact that they were out there like this for at least nine hours. And they spent almost all of this time trying to get a hold of different people in hopes that they would be able to come out and help find them. And a few of Colt's friends did actually end up coming out to the area and trying to look around for them. And I'm not talking like a quick once over, they actually ended up searching for hours, driving up and down whatever roads they could, just laying on the horn of the car while they were on the phone with Colt, trying to see if they could at least get close enough to where they were that they could hear the car horn. And that's actually a smart idea because if they could do that, then they could significantly reduce the possible area that Molly and Colt were. But no matter how hard they looked and no matter how long they honked, they just could not seem to narrow down an area that their friend might be. So knowing based on their phone conversation with Colt that he was seriously injured, rather than wasting any more time meandering aimlessly around these backwoods roads, Colt's friends decided to instead just go straight to the source of all this chaos, Khan himself. They approached him on his family's property and asked him point blank where he abandoned Colt and Molly. I mean, I wasn't there, so I can't speak to the tone of this conversation, but I have to imagine it was at the very least urgent because they know Colt and Molly are lost and even more worrying, they know that Colt is hurt. So I have to assume that they were pretty stern in their demands to know where their friend was. But Khan in response told these guys that Colt was just fucking with them. He wasn't hurt, he wasn't lost, everything was good. You know the old, the town lunatic took me on a car chase and then abandoned me and this girl in the woods and then I climbed a tree and broke my ankle and now we're stranded. Bit. It's a classic. Yeah, stupid. Mind you, Colt was still on the phone with his friend when they were having this conversation with Khan and he heard all of it. And he was pissed because he knew damn well that Khan knew damn well where they were and that everything most certainly was not good. So he tells his friend, like, let me talk to Khan. So they hand Khan the phone, but annoyingly, we will likely never know what exactly was said throughout this conversation or what the tone of the conversation was. Because as soon as Khan took the phone from Colt's friend, he stepped out of earshot for the entire conversation. And once he did get off the phone, he sort of told Colt's friends where they might find he and Molly. I guess he gave them like some landmarks to try and follow, which would have been all fine and dandy, I guess, had he not then in the same breath basically told them that they needed to get off his family's property. But these guys were determined 
to find Colton Molly. So even though not being permitted on the NIP property was going to make things significantly more difficult, they still gave it their all and tried their absolute hardest to kind of daisy chain together a roundabout route to try and make it to the location that Khan had kind of mapped out for them, albeit barely. But unfortunately, they were just not able to find Colt and Molly. And by this point, they'd lost communication with them altogether because both Molly and Colt's phones were disabled within 10 to 15 minutes of each other just before 10 a.m. It's impossible to determine if they were turned off or if they died from the hours of constant use, but I tend to lean more to the turned off side of the argument. More specifically, I think they were either taken from them and turned off or they were forced to turn them off themselves. But I'll go more in depth into my personal theory of what happened at the end. So just hang tight with that for me for a second. But yeah, their phones turned off right after one another. And from that point on, no one has seen or spoken to or heard from either Molly Miller or Colt Haynes ever again. That said, given the feverish phone calls, answered and unanswered, and the limited information they were able to get out to their friends and family, word started to spread very quickly, not just by mouth, but also via social media, of course. And once it started to, it did not take long for the fact that they were lost to get back to their parents. So Colt and Molly were both formally reported missing in Carter County relatively quickly. Their families did also try and file a formal missing persons report for the two of them in Love County as well, but anybody wanna take a guess as to how that went? If you guessed poorly, you'd be correct. Because Sheriff Joe Russell, upon hearing about these two missing young people, one of which was a literal minor child, had the audacity to proclaim that their disappearance simply was not his problem. I'm sorry, the fuck did you just say, bro? Because it sounded to me like you said that the disappearance of a child in your legal jurisdiction, the jurisdiction that you swore to serve and protect, wasn't your problem. Oh, oh, you did say that. Said it with your whole chest, huh? <laughs> Alrighty then. Ugh, and y'all, we have not even scratched the surface of our pal Joe Russell. This man is the literal embodiment of the word corruption, an atrocious disgrace to that goddamn Stetson. In fact, he infuriates me so much that I'm gonna take my break, throw on my lashes, gather myself, and when we get back, get ready to feel some of the most intense blind rage you've ever felt. Yeah, the remainder of the story is going to ignite things in you that you didn't even know existed anger wise. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so we're back. And before we took our break, we established that Joe Russell did not care that a child had gone missing in his jurisdiction. Thankfully, though, the Love County dispatcher that had taken the initial call regarding Colt and Molly's disappearance actually had a heart, and she ended up going way above and beyond what was required of her. She actually took Colt and Molly's information and she took it upon herself to create and distribute missing persons flyers, which is just so incredible. Hats off to that woman. But you wanna know something insane? That woman was fired by Joe Russell just a few short weeks later. And while to the best of my knowledge, we don't know exactly why she lost her job, I think we can all confidently guess that it was because she dared to go against Joe Russell and potentially his family, which like maybe be a good person and don't protect your law-breaking family over the safety of the general public. Anyways, back in Carter County, Wilson Police Chief Felix Hernandez was supposed to be leading the charge in the fight to bring Molly and Colt home. And while he definitely put in more effort than Mr. Joe Russell, <laughs> Not that that would have been a difficult feat. According to Molly's cousin, it still didn't seem as though he and his officers were really taking her disappearance as seriously as they should have been. Initially, they tried to classify her as a runaway because don't they always? And then even once they decided to pursue she and Colt's disappearance as legitimate missing persons cases, they had the massive uphill battle of trying to investigate something that happened not just outside of their jurisdiction, but something that happened inside the jurisdiction of someone who wanted to cover it up and pretend nothing had happened at all. So I'm sure that was fun. They did manage to orchestrate and complete some 
air searches, ground searches, and pond searches. They followed the rumor mill all the way to Texas and California because they heard whisperings that Molly and Colt had been spotted there. They orchestrated the search of a few oil wells too, following rumors that Molly and Colt had been killed and dumped in an oil well. But unfortunately, every avenue that they chose to follow seemed to lead right back to square one. And I cannot even begin to imagine how frustrating this must have been for their families. And to that sentiment, I do want to make it clear that Felix was not like a knight in shining armor for Molly and Colt's families. From what I could gather, the investigation into Colt and Molly's disappearance was disorganized at best. Not to mention that on top of that, he's allegedly done some pretty dumb underhanded shit in more recent years. And those things lead me to believe that his loyalties may have lied more with Joe Russell than he'd like people to believe. But for now, the main takeaway into this investigation is that no matter where they looked or what they did, they did not seem to have really much of anything to go off of. There actually wasn't any progress made in the investigation for close to the first two weeks. However, at about the two week mark, finally, they were able to locate the vehicle that Khan had been driving the night of Molly and Colt's disappearance, which if you'll remember was Khan's girlfriend Sabrina's 2012 Honda Accord, which following the night that Molly and Colt disappeared, she'd actually reported as stolen and filed a false insurance claim, even though allegedly she knew exactly where it was and what happened to it. Sidebar, she did face legal repercussions for this, so I guess there's that. But anyways, yeah, they found the car pretty much right where the car chase had ended and just south of where Colt and Molly's phones had pinged. And y'all, this car was tore the fuck up. Toe up from the flow up. Khan had apparently driven it through a fence, over some small trees and through the thick backwoods Oklahoma brush. But aside from the fact that it was absolutely wrecked, like totaled out by the insurance company because it wasn't worth the $18,000 it would have taken to fix it, wrecked. According to a statement released by Felix Hernandez, there was nothing else remarkable about the car. Like there was no blood or other signs of foul play. So basically finding the car didn't really help at all, other than to serve as a direct contradiction to Joe Russell's attempts to cover up the fact that the car chase had ever even happened. Not surprisingly, by the time police finally actually spoke to Khan to get his side of the story of July 7th and 8th, he had decided that he didn't know what they were even talking about. He hadn't been with Colt and Molly that night. Yeah, he pulled a straight up shaggy, wasn't him. Probably wasn't the smartest route to take considering police were able to easily debunk that story given the fact that cell phone records were able to confirm that they had in fact been together that night. But I guess lying and playing make-believe had worked for him up to this point, so it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what's really aggravating is that even though they'd almost immediately caught him in a pretty serious lie because they had absolutely no real tangible evidence to prove that foul play had even been involved in Molly and Colt's disappearance, let alone foul play that Khan was directly responsible for, they couldn't really do anything about it. Now, they were able to eventually arrest him on charges of endangering others while eluding a police officer and reckless driving for the chase the night that Molly and Colt disappeared, but even this didn't come for like six months. From what I was able to gather, the arrest warrant for Khan was issued sometime in December 2013. And on New Year's Eve, he and his family gathered at his grandparents' house before calling the sheriff's office and letting them know that he was ready to turn himself in. Happy New Year. Oh, and to clarify, I do mean Love County's sheriff's office. So yes, Joe Russell was indeed the one that ended up arresting Khan. And I don't know exactly how he felt in that specific moment about heading to jail, but in some of the pictures of him either being escorted from court or through the jail, he sure don't seem that bothered. Regardless though, through the judicial process, whenever Molly and Colt were brought up, Khan unwaveringly maintained that he had absolutely no idea where they were or what had happened to them. And I mean, nobody believes this, but that's his story and he's sticking to it. Khan posted bond pretty quickly after being arrested and was back out running amok all throughout Love County in no time. And I don't mean that colloquially. I mean, he literally bonded out and went right back to acting like the law simply did not apply to him. He enticed Oklahoma Highway Patrol into a car chase 
like a week or two later. Yeah. Apparently, not only was Khan driving double the speed limit, but I guess he was also at some points driving down the wrong side of the road. At least that's what it came across as to me when I was reading the report on it. And eerily, the chase on January 20th almost mirrored the chase from the night that Molly and Cole disappeared. It started on Oswald and eventually ended on Long Hollow when the patrolman who was pursuing Khan lost control while trying to navigate the dark windy roads that lead to the Nip property. And ultimately he ended up wrecking his patrol car into a tree. Thankfully, I believe he was just fine, but this all just begs the question, what the actual fuck is wrong with this kid? You're out of jail on bond for causing a police chase. And the best thing you can find to do to fill your time with is to instigate another police chase. Get better hobbies, my guy. Damn. And as for Joe Russell, our favorite cartoon sheriff. Look, I'm all for protecting your own and to a very small degree, I can understand nepotism. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that I can understand the sentiment of protecting and wanting what's best for those close to you. But you mean to tell me that at no point did this man get fed up with his cousin's absolute tomfoolery? Like at no point was he just like, dude, stop. Especially once he started feeling the heat and the blowback from all the stupid shit he'd gotten away with up to this point, you'd think he'd be kind of over it. Anyways, not surprisingly, Khan was arrested for this. And ultimately he actually ended up getting sentenced to three separate 10 year prison terms, all three of which were set to run concurrently. And then once that had been completed, he was required to complete 10 years of probation, which in theory sounds all well and good, but put a pin in it because he's gonna come back around a little bit later. But for now, I wanna get back to Colt and Molly as they are quite literally the reason we're here today. So following the discovery of Sabrina's car, it wasn't until March of 2014 that really any additional information seemed to come to light regarding Molly and Colt. It was March 29th to be exact when Love County 911 dispatch received a really, really bizarre phone call from yet another one of Khan's family members. The call came in supposedly accidentally from Khan's uncle, Colby Barrick. And on the call, Colby can be overheard speaking to someone seemingly about Molly and Colt's murder. I'll link down below where you can listen to the audio yourself, but in short, it went as follows. The dispatcher picks up, you know, Love County Jail, 911. What's the address of your emergency? To which no one responds. She tries again to get the caller's attention. You Hello, but all you hear in response is just like shuffling. Maybe the phone's in a pocket or maybe whoever's holding the phone is walking over leaves. But then all of a sudden you hear a man who's later determined to be Colby say, quote, you know, you're fucking mad. You know, you're fucking tired. Fucking Moxley Lake. He then goes on to mention a buck knife followed by some brief unintelligible audio before you then hear either he or the man he's with say Molly's name, full name, first and last. Colby then states they shot him in the mouth, to which his unidentified buddy responds, hmm. And then Colby assumably points and says, right there, I can put my finger all the way through it, which I don't know what that's in reference to, but okay. And then before the call cuts off, there's a splash sound that comes, I'd assume from Moxley Lake. And then there's two gunshots before the call closes out. Very weird, very concerning, very confusing. So the dispatcher reports the call up the chain of command, right to the top, right to Joe Russell. Yeah, she explains to him what she heard, that specifically she heard them talking about Molly and Colt and a girl that was killed and dope. And all JoJo has to say in response was that he wanted the tape of the 911 call handed over to him by the end of that same day. As our Lord, Savior, and Queen would say, Suspish. And as painful as I'm sure it was for Molly and Colt's families, they most certainly were not naive to the level of nepotism and, I mean, let's call it what it is, corruption, that seemed to be taking place throughout the law enforcement offices of Love County. Actually, it was that, along with their frustration at the lack of progress being made in Molly's case, that eventually pushed her family to hire a nationally recognized private investigator, Philip Klein. And from my understanding, it was around the same time, give or take, that the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation officially took over the case from Felix Hernandez and the Wilson Department. 
And in my opinion, this kind of served as a turning point in the investigation. Not completely, but it was definitely a step in the right direction. Because I think not only were they finally dealing with people that actually seemed to care, but they were also finally able to voice their concerns regarding all of the possible dishonesty and deception they felt was coming out of Love County. Oh, and they were finally dealing with people whom other people felt comfortable coming forward to with information. So that was definitely a major development. So while Philip Klein did what he could to try and retrace Holt and Molly's steps and sort of reverse engineer a timeline of the night they disappeared, the OSBI started digging into Love County. And right away, they were like, oh, well, so that's what they mean. Because from what they could tell, it seemed like so much from the time frame that Molly and Colt went missing had either been purposefully ignored or omitted from any formal documentation. Gee, I wonder who could be responsible for that. Seriously, though, I can't remember if I've said this, but Joe Russell didn't even initially document the fact that the car chase from July 7th had ever even happened. Even though it had crossed county lines into his jurisdiction, and even though he had most certainly known about it, he did everything he could to just sweep it under the rug. Yeah, until the car was actually found, he just walked around like, what car chase? Ridiculous. I don't know about you guys, but for me, it is just so hard to comprehend that this story is real. That stuff like this can and does so easily take place in small towns like this. How do you even deal with that as just a regular person? Allegedly, people were terrified of not just Joe Russell, but the whole Nip family and the power they seemed to wield over this tiny little town. And for so many years, it seems like nothing was done about it. And these poor people were just kind of like at their mercy. Can you imagine how helpless they must have felt? It is awful. It's just disgusting. It's a recipe for disaster, obviously, given the point at which we find ourselves in this very story. Luckily, though, now that the case had been taken over and Joe Russell was no longer really in control of the narrative, things kind of started moving along. For starters, in June of 2014, a witness came forward to Philip Klein and let him know that they'd been given a 9mm semi-automatic pistol and a machete that were supposedly linked to Colt and Molly's disappearance. And the witness had come to possess these weapons after he'd been given them by none other than Khan's own mother. Supposedly, according to the witness, both weapons appeared to have dried blood on them, and allegedly, Khan had given these to his mom to hold on to in case he ever needed them to exonerate him someday. The weapons were turned over to the OSBI, but if any DNA testing has been done on them or has come back as a match to Molly and Colt, they haven't released that information. That said, it's important to note that very shortly after this, Molly's case was reclassified from a missing person's case to a homicide investigation. And while I obviously can't confirm if it's related to the discovery of the weapons, I can say that the timing, in my opinion, speaks volumes. Meanwhile, while all this was going on, the OSBI started really digging into Joe Russell. <laughs> and whoo girl, they did not have to dig far before they hit the mother load. Not only did they find out that Joe had been helping to facilitate and cover up his son Willie's drug use and drug selling business, but he also allowed his son to use his home as a place to invite his friends over to partake in some recreational meth use, and he allowed him to use his patrol car as a meth mobile. Oh, and they also basically tag teamed holding a woman hostage in the house too. Some real stand-up gems, am I right? Okay, so from my understanding, I guess what happened is this woman, I think her name was Sarah, she was dating Lily at the time that all this went down, which probably seemed like a good deal considering he was the sheriff's son and she also kind of sort of happened to be eluding some arrest warrants. But the longer she was there, the more obvious it became to her that she had really gotten herself in over her head. Willie very quickly began using the safe haven he was providing her as leverage to force her to comply with whatever he wanted her to do. And whenever she would fight back against him or threaten to leave, he would remind her that if she wasn't there to make him happy, then there would be no reason for his father to not arrest her. Ugh, just ugh, disgusting. And you bet your fucking bottom dollar that when Sarah did 
finally escaped this little house of horrors in 2015. Joe arrested her, no surprise there, but he also <laughs> arrested the guy that she'd moved in with for, get this, harboring a fugitive. <laughs> These fucking people, man, I'll tell you what. These fucking people. Both Joe and Willie were arrested in mid-2016. Willie ended up pleading guilty to methamphetamine distribution and was sentenced to 40 months in prison. And Joe, <laughs> oh, Joe. Joe was arrested and charged with corruption in office, willful neglect of duty, and maladministration. Once he was formally charged, he was released on his own recognizance before he was suspended from his duties as sheriff pending a trial. Suspended? with pay, mind you. However, ultimately he ended up resigning in late October of 2016 before foregoing a trial and pleading no contest to the misdemeanor charge of willful omission to perform a duty. Sounds light, right? <laughs> oh yeah, bitch, get fucking ready. For all of the horrible, awful, terrible things we know he was involved in and likely some even worse shit that has yet to come to light, Mr. Marion Joe Russell was sentenced to, drum roll please, one year unsupervised probation. Yep, that's it. Oh, and he also had to pay $370 in court costs, so <laughs> justice served. Oh, and speaking of an abysmal lack of justice, Khan was released in 2018 after serving just four years of his 10 year sentence. Yeah, Oklahoma be fucking wildin' out, y'all. But anyways, where does this leave us with Molly and Cole? Well, unfortunately, not really much further than we were back in 2013. The FBI and OSBI have followed a ton of tips over the years, but unfortunately, none of them have ever led to the discovery of Molly and Colt's remains. They received tips that they were buried by a shed on the Knit property. They received a tip actually from Uncle Colby, 911 call Uncle Colby. He got arrested in 2018. And at some point through all of that, he alleged that they'd been buried in Moxley Pond. However, Moxley Pond was drained and searched at the end of last year, December of 2022. And unfortunately, seemingly nothing of significance was recovered. Molly's family officially had her declared dead on Wednesday, January 13th, 2021, seven and a half years after she went missing. I couldn't find anything concrete regarding Colt's status, if his family's had him legally declared dead or where exactly that stands, but regardless of his legal status, I think it's fairly obvious that as devastating as it is, they're both probably no longer with us. Cadaver dogs have been through the property on multiple occasions and they have always alerted to decomposition around the same areas. And these areas just so happen to also be right around where Molly and Colt's phones were pinging just before they disappeared. So I think that paints a pretty clear picture, at least in my opinion. The new Love County Sheriff, Andy Cumberledge, says that they're still looking into every tip they receive and they're still working closely with the OSBI. But unfortunately, at this point, I don't really think they can solve the case without someone coming forward with some major information. The investigation has just been so botched and so manipulated from the very beginning, and I just don't see how they could solve it organically at this point. But what do I know? Stranger things have happened. <sighs> the whole thing is just so sad. It's so disappointing and disheartening. It's appalling. It just, it makes me sick to my stomach. I mean, it's hard enough to lose someone you love, but to be denied the ability to say goodbye and to properly put them to rest, that's just salt in the wound. As far as my opinion of what I think happened, I think that Con and Colt ended up in some sort of altercation, whether it was in person or during that phone call they had when Colt's friends were looking for him. But either way, I think they got in a fight. We know that they weren't the best of friends to begin with. So given everything that Khan had put them through that night and the rumors that Colt had a little bit of a temper, I think it's safe to assume that Colt was probably fuming with Khan by the morning of July 8th. And I think they got in a fight. I think it went too far. And I think Colt ended up dead. And then Molly ended up dead sort of as collateral damage for lack of a better term. I think their bodies were then hidden. And I actually think that at least at one point in time, they were moved and re-hidden. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised to find out if they'd been moved multiple times throughout all of this. I don't know why I think that, but it just for some reason I have that feeling. Oh, but shoot. Uh... Okay, so there was reportedly a fire near where Molly and Colt's phones had been pinging shortly after they disappeared. So maybe I'm way off base and maybe they burned their bodies or maybe they burned, 
parts of them or maybe they burn their belongings. I don't know. It is just so frustrating because someone knows what happened and I think we all know who that someone is, but unless that someone all of a sudden grows a conscience, I fear we might be left guessing when it comes to this one for quite a while. That said, if by some chance, somehow, someone watching this video has any information that they think may help lead to the discovery of Molly and Colt or what happened to them that night, I implore you to reach out to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations. You can contact them either by phone at 1-800-522-8017 or you may submit a tip online at tips at osbi.ok.gov. There is a fairly sizable reward out there for information leading to a resolution in this case, so Maybe you're interested in that. But above all else, please remember that these people were someone's son and daughter, sister and brother, father, best friend. And if it was your loved one, I guarantee you would want someone to do the right thing and help put an end to this horrific nightmare. Anyways, let me know what you think about everything in the comments down below. I am so incredibly curious to find out what everyone else's thoughts are. But most importantly, rest in peace to poor Molly and Colt. It is so sad that they were robbed of not just so much of their own lives, but Colt's son was only like eight or nine months old when he went missing. So he was completely robbed of having a father and Colt was completely robbed of the experience of watching his son grow up. And then Molly, while she may have been going through some stuff at the time she disappeared, she still had goals, she still had aspirations, and she deserved a chance to make those things happen. And it's very obvious by how hard they continue to fight for her almost 10 years later that she had a family that loved her immensely. And I truly feel for them and for everyone involved in this harrowing ordeal. But unfortunately, with that, you guys, we are about wrapped for today. Like I said, let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you have a case or a topic you'd like to see me cover, please fill out the request submission form that I have linked in the description box, which is where you'll also find the details for everything I use to do my makeup today. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I put out new videos every week, and if you turn on your post notifications, you'll be sure to catch me back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye, guys. Ain't shit done. Uh, around the... Her 20... Oh, my God. Oh, shit. What? What? Had taken the initial... Initial? Hmm, that's new. Nope, nope. With his cousin. People were just. Oh my god, what happened? Ever needed. Oh my god, why? Fuck. You can contact the.